Come on, let your girl Adela, guys. I know how much you're loving my hair in this episode. I was, let me know in the comment section how much you're. I feel like a student right now, but people are saying that I look cute. So, hey, who cares? Thank you so much for the compliments already in advance. <laughs> Don't forget to click the thumbs up, by the way. If you're here to subscribe, like, seriously, what are you still waiting for? How about help your girl now, help my market? Let's get to that. Six or eight we are looking at it, it's looking at us. Let's get closer. Guys, today we are starting from Ghana. Charlie, how did we get here that a father would try to use his own daughter for money rituals? Half! Can you imagine? But thank God that the herbalist got him arrested. A video recorded by the herbalist contracted to perform the act caused a stare on both social and traditional media platforms. The video captured the suspect being handcuffed by police personnel who were invited by a concerned citizen. This herbalist called the police while the man was waiting. He thought that the herbalist was getting ready for him. First of all, shout out to the Ghanaian police, by the way. They must have shown up on time. Otherwise, he might have left with the daughter. And who knows, he would have found another herbalist that, that may kill this girl. So, Nigerian police, let's learn something from what this Ghanaian police did. I'm not generalizing, by the way. I know that Nigerian police is actually your friend. Amen, somebody. So, I'm just glad that the Ghanaian police showed up on on time but why seriously this man Evans Opong is his name a 42 year old man in fact in this modern age with all that one can do to make money I, I don't understand people are using their phones now to make money for you can make money on TikTok you know this one is there trying to sacrifice his own daughter at a yelling Papa we if I butcher by Ghana and also no man could you man but I'm not tough and in the matter of no one or person me come to them the escape room man me me a military man. I'm a disciplined man. Me entire in your body. Entire want to prove to the whole world. Any woman with me mind tell me say, her tradition her balance. Any nipa boni for. Any we do for. Any gun kumi nipa. Send your move Nigeria film. Any Ghana film no. This man is a bad man. Any nipa na kuruma any ye. Akola no deba se nipa nipa ni yeske dro na akola no ha. Oh, how are you? Okay, my name is Nane Dubuafu Jr. Okay? okay. What's the name of your father? Evans Papon. Evans Papon. Yes. Okay. Your father brought you here so that I'll kill you, so that he'll get money. So he brought, oh, don't be scared, my daughter, don't be scared. So I brought the police in to come and save you, so the police will take care of you. The world is a terrible place. So the Havali said that the man, Evan, said that he was going through a tough time. I'm sorry, but how would he not have a tough time when he has 12 children? No, I'm sorry, but not eight, not ten, 12 children in this day and age. Emma Bino, don't be upset. There's nothing wrong with you having 20 children if you want, but not when you cannot afford it. Obviously, the man cannot afford taking care of 12 children. Benny, how much is a condom that he cannot invest? No, no, don't beg me. I'm serious in this case. Ah, he keeps having those children, 10, 11, kill and go. What was he looking at? Now he's blaming everybody else for his problem. He's always the witches and the wizards ones in, a, in, a, in Africa. To the point where he now believes that sacrificing one of those children is the solution. Habba, he obviously doesn't even care about those children. He was just having them. But for you guys, who taught us in Africa that killing people is what will make us rich? How did we get here is what I don't understand. How did we come to that conclusion? Because it has led to the death of so many people, not just in Ghana, in Nigeria, as you guys are aware, we'll still come back to that, but also in Tanzania. You guys know I've talked about this several times, how albino kids have been killed and mutilated because of money. Why do we glorify money so much so that we keep saying, we say the end justifies the means, so much so that we are willing to kill for money. <sighs> okay, also, let me ask this question. How can you not know the caliber of herbalist that you were visiting? I don't understand. Did he not ask around? This herbalist has a LinkedIn account. <laughs> Do you guys know? He used to be in the army, in the Ghanaian army. He describes himself on LinkedIn as a shepherd, a spiritual leader, a transformational speaker, an engineer, an author. He wrote on his LinkedIn page that he is a licensed 
and registered herbalist, he described himself as a traditional healer who is dedicated to the elevation of the physical, mental, and spiritual well-being of people. I mean, he even wrote that he is the executive director of a record label. This kind of herbalist to me sounds like someone who is into herbs and well-being, you know, a way at Yebo, the type of herbalist that we love and that we are hoping that all herbalists will be in Africa. I don't think this one is into killing children. You know what I mean? And this is how all herbalists should be, healing people with natural herbs, you know? Traditional herbalists, sorry to say, the church and the Nigerian movies and Kumawood movies didn't help us. They painted us so black and most of the scenes you see in those movies, uh, herbalists killing people, using people body parts for money rituals. All those things are not true. In reality, we don't practice those stuff. I have children as a father. I can't be killing other people's children. So I decided to provide the police. So shout out to you, oh my brother, the herbalist, wherever you are, we appreciate you. God bless you, oh Janet. You know the most interesting thing about this story is uh, hearing that this man that wanted to kill his daughter came from the abroad where he's based and that he's having financial problem in the abroad. I said, first of all, which abroad gagan are we talking about? Maybe Ghanaians can help us. Maybe you can tell us. Because Togo can be an abroad. It's next to Ghana. You know what I mean? You are going abroad if you go to Ghana. Nigeria can be an abroad if you are coming from another country. When, when you go to another country, you've, you've, gone, you've gone abroad. So. <laughs> I'm sorry. So which abroad Ganga is his own because his head you know they did. But jokes aside, I mean this man could be living in the US, UK, Spain, or Australia. I don't know. The herbalist known as Nana Edu Boafo Jr. says he was hired by returning from the USA seeking to make his life better. Wow, so he was living in America. That's crazy. With all the opportunities you have in America. You want to go and kill your own daughter. I mean, even if he doesn't want to live in America because he's not making it in America, then he should go back to Ghana and hustle. It doesn't even matter where he lives. He still had the belief in money rituals. With all the opportunities that you have, this man still wanted to sacrifice his own daughter. Uh-uh. Asasilelei kesed. Ben, you know, translate that to English. That means uh, the village people finally caught up with him. Something is wrong up there. Can you imagine? You know, I don't know what else to say. I'm just so happy for this little girl, 11 years old, even though I cannot imagine the trauma of knowing that your own father, the person that was supposed to protect you, tried to kill you. I'm just really, really happy for her because guess what? Not all children are this lucky. I don't know if you guys saw the story last year, but a father in Enugu, in Nigeria, a 36 year old man, father of six children, went out with one of his sons, a seven year old boy. And guess what? He never came back with this son. And of course, the wife, people were asking about the son. At first, he was coming up with all kinds of excuses. Later, he said that his son must have been kidnapped. People were trying to help him find the son. But then, eventually, they came back to him. They were like, you were the one that took this boy out. They saw him when he was taking the boy out. And they were like, how come you did not come back? with this boy. On the evening of the 20th of October, Chidi Onyishi was alleged to have taken his first son, Chim Dalu Onyishi, out, but did not return with his seven-year-old child. The disappearance of the boy got the family and the neighborhood startled, and the search began. Do you know the neighbors said that at some point he started switching off his phone? Unfortunately, though, that boy was not as lucky. Father took the child and returned without the child. The next thing, she said, he said he doesn't know his whereabouts, but before you know it, he confessed that he used the child for a ritual, for a sacrifice. The very person that was supposed to protect that child killed him. You have to ask yourself, so did his life change after killing his own son? And the fact that if his own father had killed him, he wouldn't have had the life. But guess what? He killed his own son. And then did his life change after doing that? No. You see, this is one of the reasons why it's very important to me that we educate people about money. As a society, my people, we really need to educate ourselves about money, how to make money, not just like for you to survive from day to day, but we're talking about generational wealth. 
so that we don't have a situation where the father had some money and then the father is gone, the children are struggling, or the parents struggle, the children also struggle, their, their own children are also struggling already. We cannot continue like this, and we really need to discourage all these rituals of all kinds, even in our movies. And we need to start, you know, talking about people who did all these rituals and nothing changed for them. We don't need to kill each other. We really need to encourage people to stop getting themselves into financial mess because a lot of people got themselves into the mess and this is what people don't like to talk about especially because they would feel like you are being insensitive for example no offense when i saw that story the first thing that i noticed was that they had six kids and i looked at where they were living i'm not saying that they shouldn't have six kids please don't get me wrong but there's nothing wrong in waiting for things to get better before you have kids so that you don't now look at your child as a liability. You don't, it's, it's not a good thing for you to be seeing your children as, ah, how will I take care of this? How will I? No, 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 they're supposed to be a blessing. When God created human beings, then, he took time. He spent five days, according to the Christian faith, to create what human beings would need before creating human beings. We need to learn to be like God. He didn't create the human beings and then started running around, what would they eat? Okay, they may need trees, they may need uh, animals, they may need meat. No, 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 he thought about what they would need. You see, this thing that God gave us, brain, let's just learn to tap into it and start using it. If we don't learn anything from these stories today, we can learn about, you know, planning our lives, you know, so that life doesn't just happen to us. And I'm hoping that people will not take this wrongly, but there's nothing wrong in planning. You know, having a child is not an accident. It is not the child that is pushing you to go and do money ritual. Your child is not your problem. The child is not a burden. You don't just have a child. There's something you do before, <laughs> before you have a child. You can plan, you can plan things, you can plan your lives. Eh? so that you save money for some time, move yourself to a better place, and then start having those kids, and you won't see them as a burden. It's so, so sad that a parent would do this to their own child. So honestly, I'm so happy for this girl. Let me know what you guys think about this story. You guys know I don't know much. Guess what? I'm just keeping it real. Kenya guys, my Kenyan people have been asking, Adela, where have you been? I'm so sorry guys, you know, I've actually been here. <laughs> I've been here watching you on Plasma TV as you get ready for your own election. Guys, Kenyans, they're holding their elections in August. It is very, very close, much earlier than our own election. And they don't have as much drama as we do in Nigeria. Well, actually, um, that's not true. They also have their own drama. <laughs> First of all, do you know that the vice president, that is William Ruto, is one of the most popular candidates running? I'm like, what? Just like our own vice president. But you know, the funny thing is, the president, that is Uhuru Kenyatta, is not supporting his vice president. He has endorsed the other popular candidate who used to be his own opponent in the previous elections. I'm talking about my Kenyan father, that is Rila Odinga. <laughs> I have a lot of fathers in Kenya as well. First of all, um, let me ask, is it okay for a president to like openly endorse a successor in a democratic country, you know, like uh, the Kenyan president is doing? Is that, is that okay? I don't know. I'm just, what is this? Uh, why now? What, why do you have to put our business out there? We're talking about Kenya. Take it down, take it down, take it down. Ahem. As I was saying, the president is supporting Odinga publicly, you know, and going by the comments on social media, on YouTube, by many Kenyans, it looks like many Kenyans are happy about this because guess what? Both of them, the president and Odinga, they have history. They go way back. The rivalry between President Uhuru Kenyatta and opposition leader Raila Odinga echoes that of their fathers, the country's first president and vice president following independence in 1960. 
As in, so Kenyatta's father was the very first president of Kenya after independence, and Odinga's father was the very first Kenyan vice president. But um, Kenyatta's father, the first president, fired Odinga's father one year into office. And so since then, the two families, uh, they've been in a generational fight, kind of. Each son trying to prove his own father's ideology is better. The two men disagreed on general ideology and on resource and land allocation issues, much like their sons. Also, Odinga's people feel marginalized in Kenya because no one from his side of the country has ever been president. Since independence, no one from outside Kenya's Rift Valley or central provinces has ruled the country feeding a sense of marginalization in the West, Odinga's home region. Needless to say, Odinga has spent all his life trying to be president. Well, not all his life. He used to be prime minister, by the way. But now he has contested four different times with no luck. In fact, in 2017, when they had the post-election violence in Kenya that killed about 30 people, the election was between the two of them, you know, uh, before Odinga stepped down. And then in 2018, don't forget that I told you guys how Odinga declared himself himself as the president of the people and he had his own inauguration ceremony. <laughs> that was when he became my Kenyan father. So the two of them have been in a power tussle for a long time. But now they made peace and the president is endorsing him publicly as his successor. So that is why a lot of Kenyans are happy about this because they want peace. And this means that this is the fifth time that Odinga is running and people are now saying, let's give him a chance. Although we did that in Nigeria and it backfired. <laughs> Why he ran several times before becoming president, people were like, ah, let's give him a chance. But guess what? He messed us up. I'm not comparing Odinga to Buhari, by the way. I'm just saying that we've also had a similar situation that somebody ran several times. And then one of the ways Odinga is winning people's hearts is by having a female running mate. We were like, what? And not just any woman, no. Her name is Martha Karua, former justice minister. And this is making her the first ever female candidate on the major presidential ticket. What? Kenyans are describing this woman as a no-nonsense woman. I'm like, okay, you know, I'm excited. <laughs> Anyways, next time, let's talk about the vice president. As in, there's a lot of drama with him as well. Depending on who you ask in Kenya, some people describe the vice president, William Rito, as a very brilliant politician. And then some people say that he's the most corrupt politician. Okay. <laughs> that some people are comparing him to Atiku Abubakar that we have in Nigeria. I'm not saying that Atiku is corrupt. I'm just, okay, okay, I'm just trying, okay, you get it. I said Abba, Abba, Eberolona, how can you be comparing, don't mind them, Jari, my father, Atiku, very wonderful somebody. So, in the next episode, <laughs> So we'll talk about that next time as we keep watching on the drama that is unfolding in Kenya on our Plasma TVs. Kenyans, who are you voting for and why? <laughs> so let me know what you guys think about this story. We'll keep you posted as Kenyans get ready to go to the polls. You guys now don't watch. Guess what? I'm just keeping it real. So guys, I really want to thank my Ethiopian viewers. I mean, last Saturday, I had Hamela Aregawi on the live show and you guys, as in, you blew my mind. I was like, what? You guys came out, you showed out, you showed up. I'm like, thank you, thank you so much. And even people that were not Ethiopians, they were part of the discussion. Nigerians were in the house, Kenyans were in the house. I'm like, okay, I like when Africans come together for us to talk about things that are affecting us in Africa. So thank you, thank you, thank you. So so much for making the time the interview went on for two hours i'm sorry i didn't plan that but people kept uh submitting questions also i want you guys to please stay tuned because i don't want it to be a one-sided interview i want to bring people from the other side as well as a matter of fact when i organized this interview i had invited uh someone called alula solomon whom a lot of ethiopians would be familiar with but unfortunately he did not get back to me because i wanted both sides
rights to be represented that day during the interview and I'm pretty sure he just didn't see my invitation uh, so you know hopefully he would get back I don't know but I'm still working on getting someone from the other side so that we can have a more balanced um, interview but I just wanted to thank you guys now if you missed it it is on YouTube I will put the link in the description below also last Monday we were supposed to pick the winner of the free 500 square meter land that Grace of Ray is giving out guess what it would be happening this Monday this coming Monday the 13th of June please please make sure that you join us live same time 1 p.m. Eastern time 6 p.m. Nigerian time it won't be long at all we're, th we're thinking within half hour we should be done but we want to pick the winner live so that you guys see the process also if anybody has any questions for Grace of Ray that would be an opportunity to ask her any questions that you may have have you clicked the thumbs up button yet like seriously what are you waiting for have you subscribed as in all right y'all it's been and i can continue right up in here don't forget to follow me on facebook twitter and instagram and if you're yet to subscribe to my channel i'm watching you on plasma tv press the subscribe button and the bell button until next time i'm gonna see you all later peace out